Well, welcome back to the Offbit. Today we'll be revisiting our P5Q Pro motherboard build from our previous video. We've upgraded the CPU from the E7500 Core 2 Duo to a Core 2 Quad Xeon E5430. We've also changed the GPU from the GTS 450 to an NVIDIA GT640. So stick around as we see how this system runs through our benchmarks and how does this machine game with a few relevant titles for 2021. First, before we go anywhere, we must stipulate that this CPU cannot run all games in 2021. This is because of new instruction sets and requirements in the new CPU performance that this CPU cannot meet. So, with that aside, let's look at our Xeon E5430. The Core 2 Quad Xeon E5430 is almost identical to the Core 2 Quad Q9450. Both CPUs are built on the 45 nanometer node and are also 4-core, four 4-threaded four CPUs. Both have 12 meg of level 2 cache and are clocked at 2.66 GHz. Both CPUs run on a 1333 MHz frontside bus. Now, here are the differences. The E5430 was released in 2007, where the Q9450 was released in 2008. The Xeon has a TDP of 80 watts, and the Q9450 has a TDP of 95 watts. The Xeon runs on the LGA771 platform, which we have modded our CPU to fit the LGA775 platform. The Xeon does support multi-CPUs, and finally the names of the architecture for the Xeon is Harpertown, and the Q9450 is Yorkfield, but both CPUs are Penrhyn-based CPUs. The GPU we're using today is the NVIDIA GT640 from Asus. This version we have is the GT640-2GD3. There is a couple of different variants of this GPU. The one we have is the GK107-300-A2, which was released on the 5th of June 2012, comprising of 2 gig of DDR3 RAM clocked at 1782 MHz on a 128-bit bus. Our core clock for the GT640 is 901 MHz. This GPU has a TDP of 65 watts and therefore does not need an extra power plug in the back of the card. Our GT640 also has two DVI connectors, one RGP and one HDMI port for display connectivity. The motherboard we're using today is the Asus P5Q Pro. This motherboard is an LGA775 motherboard running the Intel P45 Express chipset. Supporting max bus speeds of 1600 MHz, it has four DDR2 DIMM slots, two PCI 2.0 x16 slots, three PCI x1 slots, and two standard PCI slots. Supporting BIOS overclocking options and AMD Crossfire, this board does come with six SATA ports and can be rated in 0, 1, 10 0, and RAID 5. It also has an extra two SATA ports via a silicon image chip. The P5Q Pro does also have an onboard Gigabyte Ethernet, 6 USB 2.0 ports, Firewire and 6 audio jacks on the back of the motherboard. Once again we have a mixed bag of RAM. We have a total of 4 gig of RAM today, with one set being a 2 by one gig high NIC setup and the other two sticks of 1 gig RAM from Corsair and PQI. All the RAM modules we're running today are at 667 MHz. And of course, it is DDR2 RAM. Finally, the drives we're using today are our standard. We have our 120GB Western Digital Green SSD for our operating system. We also have our 256SP SSD drive for some of our games and the 1TB Western Digital Green Magnetic Drive for some of our bigger games. We're running Windows 10 as usual. Our build today of Windows 10 is 1909. And everything today is being powered through our Thermaltake 500W PSU. Let's get into the benchmarks. The first synthetic benchmark we're starting today is 7-Zip. In 7-Zip, the E5430 slightly underperformed in its single core performance compared to the Core 2 Duo E7500, which is fine. It is basically the same architecture, but the E7500 has a higher clock. The E5430 makes a bit of ground with the extra cache in the single performance, but does not win out in the end for the single core performance being approximately about minus 2% slower. In the multi-core test, the E5430 Xeon pushes out in front of the Core 2 Duo E7500, which you should expect to be almost double on reflection of the single-core performance of the Core 2 Duo E7500. Overall, in the multi-core, the Xeon E5430 puts out an approximate 89% increase in performance over the Core 2 Duo E7500. 
CPU Z showed us a similar story. The Xeon E5430 in its single core performance was a bit worse off at an 8% decrease in performance. Our multi-score score gave us a 79.31% increase in performance over the Core 2 Duo E7500. So a said basically showing a similar trend to 7-Zip's performance test. In Cinebench R15, the E5430 Xeon beat the E7500 Core 2 Duo by an approximate 91% increase in performance. Basically what we can say about this data is that in single and dual core work from the E7500 Core 2 Duo will do a lot better. Having the extra two cores though makes a big difference when those cores can be utilized. And trust me, in this day and age, four cores or four threads more is a lot better than two. So this upgrade makes sense once you put it into that perspective. Also on top of that, the extra L2 cache on the Xeon will contribute to better performance on hole as well. Moving on to our NVIDIA GT640. In Cinebench R15, the GT640 married with the Xeon E5430 gave a similar performance to a GTX 750 with a Q6600, which is rather interesting. We do think that the Q6600 was probably holding back the GTX 750. The NVIDIA GT640 also did beat the Radeon HD 6570, which is nothing surprising there. Now, Cinebench R15 is probably not the best test to show us pure GPU performance. Cinebench to us seems to show us the combinational performance of both CPU and GPU put together. So what I'm trying to say is, a slower CPU will affect the faster GPU in Cinebench, which is kind of what actually happens in the real world anyway. Moving on to Unigine Heaven. In Unigine Heaven, the GT640 pushed out in front of the HD 5770. We did sit behind the HD 5850 by a small margin. The GTX 750, on the other hand, absolutely demolished the GT640. And so it should. Lastly on our list is 3 Mark's Firestrike's benchmark. In Firestrike, the GT640 placed behind the HD 5770 and in front of the HD 6570. So all these benchmarks really do just show that we probably need to be running lower resolutions, maybe lower than 720p in some cases in these games. However, we're still confident we should be able to get something playable from this setup, and it should perform better than last week's build of the same PC, but with the Core 2 Duo E7500. Now we've done all the benchmarks, let's jump into some games. Our first game we're going to start up with is Sea of Thieves. We ran Sea of Thieves at low details, or better known in the Sea of Thieves world as Cursed. We ran the resolution at 540p, which is lower than 720p, as we discussed when we were going through the benchmarks. Though the game resolution was set so low, it was still surprisingly good looking, even at low details. In all, the game ran pretty smooth at these settings, only suffering with some load stutter when the islands loaded in. We did also experience a little bit of load lag on first asset loads, but overall, the game played pretty good. Frame rates for Sea of Thieves. Average frame rate hit 42.2 frames per second. Our minimum frame rate hit 0.3 frames per second. And our maximum frame rates hit 52.9 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows hit 0.3 frames per second. As the data shows, the game did suffer from some load stutter, which was basically when islands loaded, as we said. It does seem to be the main problem in this game, especially with lower end performance systems. Though fortunately, it does not occur all that frequently, only when you're going past islands or going onto islands, and it's predictable. So overall, it's not too bad if you know it's coming. Moving on to an old classic, GTA 5. We ran GTA 5 at 1280 by 720 at very low settings. The game for the most of it did run fairly smooth, though this would sometimes be interrupted with some load stutter. But this did not happen for long, and when it did happen, it was only on long, fast drives through the world. In our opinion, this game did run really well on this system. Benchmarks for GTA 5. Average frame rate hit 51.3 frames per second. Our minimum frame rates hit 0.6 frames per second. Maximum frame rates hit 75.2 frames per second, with a 0.1% lows at 0.6 frames per second. As the data shows, once again, just like Sea of Thieves, that the CPU falls behind at times and therefore the game suffers with load stutters. An overclock might actually smooth this out, but at stock clocks, it's not so bad. Next, we tried our hand at Valorant. We ran Valorant at 1920x1080 at low details. The game did run very smooth, though we did not exactly sit at 60 frames a second all the time, but it ran great otherwise. I do wish I could play Valorant as well as this machine does, and I do apologize for that, but I still had fun nonetheless. 
our frames for Valorant. Average frame rate was 63.4 frames per second. Our minimum frame rates hit 21.8 frames per second, and our maximum frame rate hit an 82.1 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows was at 2.1 frames per second. Overall, Valorant ran great, like we said, as it shows in the data. The game did suffer from some load lag at the very beginning of the game, but it doesn't matter so much because that part of the game is the warm-up round. Look, this game really does run great, and I think it is a go-to competitive game for anyone with an older system. Moving on to another relevant title for 2021 is Genshin Impact. We ran Genshin Impact at 1280 by 720 at very low settings. This game did run well for most of the time on this system, though we did suffer a bit of load stutter from time to time. The CPU really did have a workout in this game, spending a lot of the time at 100% utilization across all cores. We also did run into a little bit of stutter, especially in combat or just loading around the world. But fortunately, due to the nature of this game, it really does not penalize you for not always having a smooth frame rate. Benchmarks for Genshin Impact. Average frame rate was 43.6 frames per second. Our minimum frame rates fell to 10.9 frames per second and our maximum frame rates hit 60.9 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows hit 2.0 frames per second. Now, as our metrics show, the game actually runs all right. We did not get staggeringly fast FPS on average, but on the other hand, we didn't actually get something that wasn't playable either. Yes, we did have a few stutters here and there, but overall, it wasn't too bad. Definitely hours of enjoyment that can be had with this system and this game. Finally, our last game today, and that's the old classic, Minecraft. We're running Minecraft Bedrock Edition for Windows 10. Now, if you are unfamiliar with Minecraft and how they release their updates, about every year they release some large brand new content that adds into the Minecraft world. I do believe this is a part of the reason why Minecraft just never dies, as well as its endless creativity, Lego-like gameplay. Now, the next update hopefully will drop sometime later this year, which will hold new cliffs and cave formations, which I'm actually quite excited about. Now, putting that aside, let's look at how Minecraft actually runs on this system. We ran Minecraft at default settings with a resolution of 1920 by 1080. The Bedrock version of the game is the best one to run if you have an older PC. Hence, that's why we chose this one. Now, this game pretty much ran smooth all the time with only a few times where the frames per second went below 40 FPS. All right, let's check out the frames. So, Minecraft Bedrock Edition on the X5430 with the GT640, average frame rate of 54.0 frames per second. Our minimum frame rates hit 38.2 frames per second, and our maximum frame rate hit 62.4 frames per second. The 0.1% lows hit 23.4 frames per second. As the stats show, this game just ran brilliantly. Look, 0.1% lows at 23.4 frames per second. Now, this thing is running great. Also, this game is such a good game to sink your teeth into. The classic looks, the endless creativity, and the smooth gameplay, mixed with what seems like a forever new content being released for free. Well, you need to buy the game first, but past that, you're set. My opinion, you can't go wrong with this game. This game, it's still pretty cheap. It runs on almost anything. Just got to have a video card that supports the shaders now and pretty much a quad-core CPU, and this thing is perfect. Now, let's wrap things up. I must admit, this system did run pretty well. Though we have hand-picked the games that it could play, the Xeon E5430, yes, it's an old processor, but still able to punch some weight still today. There is really no reason to say that this CPU is done just yet. With a good overclock, these Core 2 Quad Xeons really can shine. Though lacking some of the newer CPU instructions can be an unavoidable problem, and yes, this is going to become more and more of a common thing with these CPUs. So unfortunately, I think there is a timestamp left on these CPUs that we can still run them but they still run the operating system quite fine. So maybe moving away from a gaming processor to more something that you use just an operating system and your word processing and your Excel and all that sort of office type work. The NVIDIA GT640. Yes, this GPU was a surprise. This mid-level slash entry-level GPU was able to keep up with the games that we threw at it today. Though yes, you'll have to drop the resolution backs and run lower details. 
but you can still have fun with this older GPU when you select the right games, of course. Now, the system overall, we were actually quite impressed with how it performed, as we have said. So yes, it won't run a lot of AAA titles well, or sometimes at all. And yes, some of those games are going to be indie games as well. But with a bit of tinkering around with resolutions and settings, you'll find yourself an enjoyable experience with this older system. Now that's all we have once again for the off bit. Now if you've enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. If you have not subscribed to this channel yet, we would love to have your support. So yes, hit that subscribe button. And finally, always feel free to leave us a line in the comments. Thank you for watching and we'll catch you next time on the off bit.